Hi guys and welcome back to the channel. So about a week ago, I eventually got round to taking the Snow Pro Advanced Architect certification. Lucky enough, I passed. The aim of this video is to give you a bit of information about the certification itself, some tips and hints and some areas I, ex I would recommend that you look into, especially if you're preparing to do the certification yourself. So I'm hoping that you find it useful. My name is Adam Morn, and I've written a couple of books on Snowflake. I've also been lucky enough to speak in front of my peers on a number of occasions. I've lived and worked in the UK, Europe and Australia during my career. And today, I'm on a mission to help as many people as I can fulfill their career potential. By adding as much value as I can around data strategy and modern cloud data platforms. And in this video, my aim is to help you in preparing for the SnowPro Advanced Architecture Certification. Now, before we dive into the four domains that you're going to be tested on and, and run through those in order and give you some guidance, Let's just talk about prerequisites first of all. So it suggests that you need two years plus experience working in some kind of architecture capacity with Snowflakes or de designing solutions on top of Snowflake. And when we get into the detail, I'll explain why um, you know having some hands-on experience is absolutely a must for me um, because some of the questions will catch you out if you haven't got that hands-on ex practical experience in the real world. Next thing is you obviously need to pass the SnowPro core certification. That's the baseline certification that you need to pass in order to access any of the, I think there's four or five at the moment, SnowPro advanced certifications. There's the architect one that I'm talking to you about today, but there's also database administrator, data engineer, and data scientist. But talking about the architect exam specifically, 65 questions, 115 minutes, and you need to score 750 points or more out of a possible 1,000. All the questions are gonna be multiple choice, so you're selecting from a set of three or four different answers, or you're gonna be asked to pick multiple choice. So again, you'll be presented with a number of different answers, but this time it may prompt you to select two or three possible answers in response to that question. So the four domains that you're gonna be tested on are accounts and security, which makes up the bulk 30% of the test and score, Snowflake architecture 25%, data engineering 20%, and performance optimization 25%. So let's get into things, starting with the accounts and security section, given it's the largest one. So really, really make sure that you know about data sharing and access to data shares. Look at the imported privileges um, on the Snowflake documentation. This is really important because if you provide somebody with a data share, a data consumer, for example, and you need to delegate access for them to set up permissions and do things on that share, imported privileges is how you do that. Note that you will get questions around that topic, the role hierarchy and the different levels of access, specifically focused on inheriting privileges through that hierarchy and how that works. You might get presented with diagrams, a, a set of different diagrams um, to best set up a hierarchy based upon a certain set of requirements. That inheritance technique and how roles can inherit privileges from one another to simplify the implementation and design of that setup within the RBAC security framework that Snowflake deploys is really going to help you when it comes to the certification. Make sure as well you're clear on how to grant privileges and revoke them, as well as how to check what privileges certain roles have. Specifically, I would recommend as well checking out tasks and how you grant execute on a task and what role you need to have to be able to do that. Network policies, so network policies um, can be set at the account in user level only. This allows you to add an additional layer of security on top of the out of the box functionality that Snowflake comes with. You can add this network level security, call network policies, that prevents certain IP addresses to access Snowflake. So again, it's additional level of security a layer above your Snowflake account. I'd also get really familiar with the concept of a Snowflake organization that can have multiple accounts and have a think and do some research around what would lead you as an architect to decide to have more than one Snowflake account within an organization. It's really important that you consider the benefits and the trade-offs of having multiple accounts set up and what would lead you to make that decision. The final couple of points on this accounts and security domain is around compliance and auditability. 
So if you needed to audit access um, and see what users have done what on the Snowflake account, where would you go? Check out the, the time retention limits as well as part of the account usage um, areas in Snowflake. Go into detail around those. And finally, authentication methods. Make sure that you're clear on the different ways the different tools can authenticate. Um, not just Snowflake I'm talking about here, I'm talking about Kafka. Snow SQL and the Snowflake API. Next up, let's have a chat about the architecture domain makes up 25% of the certification. So data sharing is gonna be a big part of the certification. It's obviously a, a big advantage and a competitive feature that Snowflake has against a lot of other providers. Therefore, they're gonna make sure that you know how it works in the real world. Cross cloud, cross region, what the limitations are. So for example, if you've got a Snowflake account running on Azure and a Snowflake account running on uh, GCP. You want to enable data sharing between those accounts. Well, at the moment, can't do that directly. You need to replicate that data from an Azure account, for example, to a GCP Snowflake account, and then configure your data sharing setup. Make sure that you understand the sequence of those steps involved. At first, you would need to replicate the data to the same cloud provider as your data consumer before then creating the data share and setting up access. Really important, you might get a bunch of questions around that category. Um, you might get a question around, um, you know, your account has been the same, nothing's changed, but your data storage costs have suddenly increased. What could the, be the nature of that and why has that happened? Consider things like um, some of the answers here might be cloning. Obviously that doesn't take up any storage. Uh, until you make changes to a clone at that point, then the versions of records are stored and then you will incur a, char a charge and a cost. Um, or consider if you're creating um, objects using time travel, obviously as data ages in your Snowflake account environment, then that storage is gonna go up as you've got more versions of those records over time persistent in the background. Consider those areas, consider the balance between storage and having that, the time travel data available, for example, because um, you may well get asked questions around that. Uh, what objects can be cloned? Be clear on what you can clone and what you can't clone, and also the nuances, things like um, snow pipes. What happens if you clone a pipe? Is it in a pause state, for example? Uh, the reasons why it would be in a pause state initially, and then what you have to do to activate that. Think about external um, stages as well with regards to uh, cloning. Um, it's often one that catches people out. Again, coming back to sort of data sharing, but from a Snowflake customer to a non-Snowflake customer, you'd be using reader accounts. Just be clear on that setup, how it would work, where that credit consumption would go. Finally, um, private data exchanges. Um, I think it is scenarios where they'd be, they'd, they'd be beneficial, so sharing data within your organization. Um, but you maybe want to share it with third parties as well. And you maybe want the members have a requirement that they can only see their own data. You may want to set up um, private data exchanges and give them access just to data that they need. Let's move on to data engineering. So 20% of the certification is based around this. Um, make sure you're aware of materialized views. There's a lot of limitations um, with regards to them. For example, they can't include a join, they can't include group buys, um, that kind of thing. There's some quite severe limitations around using materialized views. Make sure that you're clear on those limitations and the advantages of where you would use one. For example, if the underlying table data, just a small subset of that is changing relatively infrequently and you've got a lot of queries that target that, or you may want to provide different access paths to the underlying table with a different set of clustering keys. Again, materialized views could come in quite handy there from, from an implementation perspective. Check it out, go to the documentation. Um, you know, it's something that we talk about with our members and then cover in a lot of detail on the Master and Snowflake program, file loading behavior. So for example, if you loaded five files and if you had the load parameter um, on error continue, for example, set, one of those files failed to load. You want to fix that file and reload it again. What do you need to do? What I liked about this question and the nature of some of the other questions is that you need to know then if you were just to run the uh, copy into command again, certainly within a, a, a 64 day time period, Snowflake would recognize and understand what files are already loaded. So it would try to load them again. It would pick up the file that didn't load. If the data had been correct, that was previously caused an error, it would load that in. The answers here would say, just run the copy into command again. 
I'm going to copy into command and specify a file name. Um, or it would come up with a couple of other options which um, were obviously incorrect in terms of the behavior and the default behavior in Snowflake. And that's what I liked about these questions. It would infer something. It wouldn't necessarily give you that answer kind of hidden in the question. You would need to know the behavior how Snowflake works by working with Snowflake to understand which sort of two answers from the potential four it was providing you with. The other ones um, that I would recommend looking into is unloading data. Make sure you're clear on some of the copy options when you unload data to an external stage, as well as working with semi-structured data. So using query and JSON data, using dot notation. Um, just remember about the case sensitivity. Again, if you're not clear on that, uh, either uh, go on to the documentation on Snowflake or uh, check out some of the uh, articles online about that. There's some really good content out there. And uh, finally on data engineering, if you run an emerge SQL statement and you've got multiple source rows, for example, that join to a target record, what would happen? What would the default behavior be for Snowflake in that scenario? Moving on to performance optimization. So the last section, 25% in this domain, understand clustering keys, understand where you go. So clustering information um, tables, um, to check for average overlaps. What does that actually mean? Um, how, when you look at the clustering, um, cluster information and you get a histogram, what is that telling you? Is, is a table well clustered or not? How would you choose a good clustering key? Caching, the three different types of caching, the metadata cache, the result set cache and the warehouse SSD cache, what they're there for, how you would use them. The, the caveats around that, so the data changes underneath when that goes stale, the fact that different virtual warehouses serving the same account can share the warehouse cache and help other queries out if those queries are, are returning similar data sets. Understand what an exploding join means and how to identify that in the query profile. Again, it's something that we cover in a lot of detail on my Master and Snowflake program with the members there, how to identify them and how to correct it. Essentially, though, it's a Cartesian product. Um, when you're having a many-to-many -many join, it can be easily spotted in the query profiler. Finally, just touching back upon caching again. When you go into the query execution plan, when it is using the cache, and if there's data spilling as well, what does that mean? Um, well, the virtual warehouse then hasn't got enough memory to contain the result set. It spills to disk. That's that shows itself up in the query profile. And so that basically covers all the kind of notes and the areas I think that you should look into that may not necessarily be obvious to you. I really hope it's gonna help you in terms of passing the Snowflake advanced architect certification. I really wish you the, the best of luck in that. If you got good value from this video, please share it with other people who might be preparing for the certification and keep watching, keep subscribing. New videos coming very soon. I also wanted to let you know about our Master and Snowflake program with myself that we run and it's, it's an exclusive signature program to help you master Snowflake and learn how to design, implement and scale solutions in the cloud. And I've designed this program specifically for those people who have either scratched the surface using Snowflake or who are stuck working with legacy on-premise technologies and haven't been invested in by their companies and have fallen behind in their career. And what I've done is packaged up my knowledge and experience of working with Snowflake since 2017 and learning how to package up Snowflake's out-of-the-box capabilities in a way where you can apply them in the real world to address common challenges. So this program isn't about theory. Of course, I need to introduce you to the concepts if you're new to Snowflake, and many of my members are, but it's really about introducing the theory and then in practice how you apply those in the real world. I've been through the pain of understanding what works and what doesn't. Now I've got a formula or a set of recipes, if you like, that show you how to do that. So the Master in Snowflake program includes in-depth, on-demand video course content that I've created that all include practical hands-on demos. I provide access to all the code, templates, and files that I use as part of those demos. So you can download them and use them freely. You may want to use them in your day-to-day -day work. You may want to take them and customize them and use them as a starting point. All members on the program get exclusive access to a members-only group where everybody can help each other out and share their knowledge and best practice and get expert advice. Finally, 
I also carry out a group 60 minute coaching call with all the members, totally optional, where you can ask me anything about Snowflake, data analytics, data strategy, data architecture, you name it, um, interview advice, and I can help you and give my um, input and help and support and guidance around that. Finally, you'll get lifetime access to all future updates. Snowflake's changing and evolving. There's new features and releases every week, and you'll continue to benefit from those updates as well. At a high level, there's 10 modules. This is what we cover, everything ranging from the Snowflake architecture to getting data into Snowflake. And then once you've got data, how do you effectively use it, secure it, share it, and work with it to ensure that you get the maximum value from your Snowflake implementation? If you're interested, I've included the application link in the video description below. If this sounds like the thing that you're looking for and you want to supercharge your career, and if you're ready to take the ultimate step, I'd really encourage you to fill out the application form below.